Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. We're studying the Gospel of Matthew. Today we'll begin chapter 23. We'll conclude that in another video. So thanks for joining in and let's get started. Here is our outline of the entire study. We're calling it Jesus Christ, the King of the House of David. We're in the section entitled Facing Rejection, which will continue on through the end of chapter 25. In that section, we're talking about questions, discourses, and parables of judgment. And in today's lesson, we will look at uh, an introduction to Matthew 23 because we need to talk a little bit more about just who were the scribes and Pharisees and then we'll look at verses 1 through 14 and just to prepare you I must say that in some translations verse 14 does not appear so I will leave the ESV for that verse and go to the New King James Version to get that verse into our study the rest of the chapter will leave for another study we have been following the chronology of Christ last week. We are now in Tuesday of that week and will continue there through the first part of chapter 26. People rarely pay attention to the outburst of anger of a bad-tempered man, but when a meek humble and generally mild person gets angry, people have to wonder. Jesus basically tears into the scribes and Pharisees in this chapter like he had never done before. Well, where did the scribes and Pharisees come from in the first place? There's no mention of them in the Old Testament. Well, the scribes, of course, but not the Pharisees. The Jews had seen their political power disappear over the last 500 years, but they still possessed the law of God. During the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, the people could return to Jerusalem and reestablish their nationality. When Ezra, the scribe, read the law before the people, something happened. I suggest you pause the video and go read Nehemiah 1 through 8. From that day forward, the study of the law was committed to the men of the great synagogue, and those were the scribes. So, the scribes then are mentioned in the Old Testament, but not the Pharisees. However, by the time the scribes were done interpreting the law, the rules and regulations took up 50 volumes. It was during the persecution of Israel by Antiochus Epiphanes in 175 B.C., that the Pharisees emerged as a separate sect. The name Pharisee means the separated ones, and at the height of their power, they numbered around 4,000. They were dedicated legalists. No part of the scribal writings were to be left unobserved. They were completely earnest in their attempt to keep the whole law perfectly. In the Jewish writing, the Talmud, it lists seven, seven different kinds of Pharisees. The shoulder Pharisee, he obeyed the law, but did so to be seen of men. The wait a little Pharisee, this man always had an excuse to postpone doing a good deed. The bruised or bleeding Pharisee, to avoid even seeing a woman on the street, they would close their eyes or put their heads down, thus walking into walls and stumbling in the streets. The humpbacked Pharisee, they walked about town in a perpetual bow while shuffling their feet because they wanted others to believe they were just that humble. The compounding Pharisee believed every good deed he did put God further in his debt. He's what we call a balance sheet religionist. There was the fearing Pharisee. He lived his life in dread of the final judgment. His whole life was lived in terror of that final judgment. And finally, there was the God-fearing Pharisee. This man really and truly loved God and delighted in obeying God's will regardless of the difficulties. 
The man that immediately comes to mind in the New Testament is Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul. So according to the Jews' own writings, there were six bad types of Pharisees and only one good type. The folks in the crowd probably stood in full agreement with everything Jesus denounced concerning the Pharisees. What Jesus says in this chapter is radical surgery, but it was necessary. Here's some thoughts from James D. Bales. Depending on the individual listening to his words, three possible purposes could be accomplished. Some of the Pharisees might be shocked and awakened. Of course, that's what Jesus was hoping. Others might be warned away from following blind leaders, also a good thing. And thirdly, it's a general warning to even us today, lest we become like the Pharisees or be misled by them. I'm going to put a link to a tract by James D. Bales in the description below. And that is where these things came from, th this point came from. It's a short tract, and it's only available, as far as I could find it, as uh, a download for ebooks. But I, did, I will provide a link that will let you get a copy of it for less than $3. So, let's get our Bibles out and read the first four verses. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. The Pharisees were making religion a burden to the people. Jesus reminds the people that when the scribes and Pharisees taught the law, it must be followed even if they were not following it themselves. If they taught the law correctly, it must be followed. When we studied the Sermon on the Mount back in chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, we learned that the Ten Commandments were based on two great principles, reverence and respect. These principles are eternally binding and valid, even under the new law. However, the Pharisees' view of it taking thousands of regulations to properly carry out the law had made it an intolerable burden. Jesus teaches us that there are basically four tests of true religion. Number one, is it designed to lift one up or drag one down? Number two, does it make joy or does it make depression? Number three, does it help a man or haunt a man? And number four, will it carry a man or will he have to carry it? Unfortunately, the Pharisees had made the law of Moses into a religion that was no longer true. The Pharisees would allow no relaxation of what they deemed the whole law. A critical question is not who is teaching, but whether truth is taught. See the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, 15-18. Let's read a few more verses. They, that is the Pharisees and scribes, do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplace, and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called by instructors, or I'm sorry, neither be called instructors, 
for you have one instructor, and that is Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. The Pharisees had made the law of Moses into a religion of ostentation. It is inevitable that if a religion depends on one following a huge set of rules that a man would want his peers to see that he was doing them all and doing them all well. They made their phylacteries broad. The tephilin, T-E-P-H-I-L-L-I-N, were like little boxes, one worn on the wrist and the other on the forehead. To see more about this, you will want to look at the passages you see on your screen. The wrist-worn box contained a parchment with these four passages in them. Exodus 13, 1 through 10, 13, 11 through 16, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and 11, 13 through 21. Meanwhile, the box on the forehead was divided into four compartments, which each contained a small scroll with one of these passages written on it. The Pharisees made these bigger than needed so that everyone would notice them. So to get an idea of why they were wearing these, let me just encourage you to pause the video and go look at these passages for a minute and then come back. They also wore oversized tassels or fringes on their garments. You can see about this in Numbers 15 and Deuteronomy 22. They were worn to help the Jew remember the commandments of God. And even today, they're seen on the Jewish prayer shawl. Once again, the Pharisees wore his bigger than the norm for an ostentatious display. They wanted seats of prominence at the front where they could be seen. And they wanted to be addressed as rabbi and be treated with the greatest respect. They, wanted, they liked being called Father. Jesus reminds them that there is only one spiritual teacher, and that is Jesus, and only one spiritual Father, God. It makes me wonder why people today in some parts of so-called Christianity are determined to call their preacher or their priest Father, when Jesus particularly said, don't do it, here in Matthew chapter 23. It makes you wonder what some people are doing besides calling a human man Father that Jesus denied should be done. While the Pharisees strove to be noticed and glorified, the true believer should strive to point all the glory to God. A false religion produces ostentation in action, one, and two, pride in the heart. I'm going to step aside from the ESV for a minute and read verses 13 and 14 from the, Inc., the New King James Version, and I'm reminding you that in, in many of the more up-to-date versions, Verse 14 is not included. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive a greater condemnation. A.T. Robertson said, Here begins the rolling thunder of Christ's wrath, and so do begin the woes and the calling of hypocrisy. Jesus will enumerate seven woes in the next verses, from here through verse 26. What about woe and hypocrite? Well, one, woe is, is a word that includes both doom and sorrow. 
and hypocrite eventually came to mean in the Greek language one who plays a part. Why were the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites? Well, they staged an outward appearance of being law followers, but inwardly they were bitter, prideful, and arrogant. Not only were the scribes and Pharisees going to miss out on God's kingdom, they were shutting the door in the faces of the common folk. To do God's will and be a citizen of the kingdom are really one and the same. To do God's will, the Pharisees believe they must follow thousands of petty rules and regulations set forth by the scribes. Meanwhile, God's kingdom basically hinges on love, not rules. The people used the Pharisees as the role models to enter the kingdom, and if they did, they were doomed to fail. The Pharisees preferred their ideas of religion to God's idea of religion. Rule 1. To teach others the good news of God, one must first listen to God themselves teacher becomes a false teacher when he puts his prejudices up as universal principles and substitutes his own ideas for the truth of God. It is then that he becomes a barrier and not a guide for those seeking the kingdom. Through false teaching, through self-righteousness and traditionalism, legalism locks people out of the kingdom. Verse 14 is not contained here in Matthew, as I mentioned, uh, in many of the modern translations. However, if you go to Mark 12:40 and Luke 20:47, the older manuscripts do confirm the validity of this verse. Number one, the Pharisees are condemned for preying on those who could not protect themselves, such as widows, and their pretentious long prayers were a waste of time, sometimes lasting, according to secular history, as long as three hours. That's all we have time for for this video. I sure appreciate you studying with me. Next time we'll continue our study and finish it, uh, Matthew chapter 23. If you have an opportunity, please subscribe to the channel like or dislike this video, leave me a comment. All that would be really, really appreciated on my part. Until the next time we meet, may God bless.